Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation to, to speak. And uh, I hope that you all have had a, a nice conference so far, or what you have seen of it. And I hope that I can offer something of a different perspective in uh, moving, moving us outward and back to our normal everyday lives, or what we might perceive of as somewhat normal lives. And Thinking about this question of technology, perhaps as a kind of question related to a certain fetishism around technology and progress. Uh, and specifically, what I want to think about is the question of how this works through the smart city concept, uh, because this is a concept that is increasing in circulation in the Eurasian space. And many of you are probably familiar with these sorts of images here, right? That you have uh, not, not just you know the, the image of Moscow as connected with lots of beautiful lights, uh, but a city that is connected with all these sort of you know just digital lines and you throw these digital lines on a photograph and all of a sudden it becomes a smart city advertisement uh, that this is a kind of visual production of this idea of the smart city that is probably familiar to you. Uh, also, if you're from Helsinki, uh, you've probably seen some of these uh, initiatives in the region, smart city, smart region, uh, and, and pushing this idea in uh, a place like this kind of makes sense. Uh, and you can see this in, in other initiatives, such as projects together with Siemens uh, trying to promote this, um, again paying attention to the advertising and the way that these images are represented uh, through the sort of semiotics of, of the digital uh, in, in, in this way. Uh, and this is also just a little bit of meta theater here, right? Uh, an event just a couple of days ago here in this exact space on smart cities uh, with initiatives of the, of the university, of the high data project. Uh, and using the institutional space to promote the smart city concept. Or if you look just across the border in, uh, in Estonia, that this is, this is an idea you find there. It's reproduced through all sorts of different reports. And uh, again, a sort of educational institutions partnering. So here we have UCL, University College of London, partnering with Arup uh, and a, another Livable Cities initiative, among others. So it's these sort of configurations of a number of academic research uh, partners partnerships trying to come together to promote livable, more clean, more green, more usable, more tech-friendly cities. It's also promoted through other institutional structures like um, these, these big events related to the Smart City Expo World Congress here, right? And at, this, at these events, there are winners, which city will enter and get the, the award for being the smartest smart city. Uh, the last year in 2018 was awarded to uh, Singapore. And this is, you know, from, from the advertisement related to that, that uh, from healthcare to transport, the government of Singapore uh, has developed these smart solutions with the vision of getting all the citizens interacting with the government uh, almost entirely through their smartphones. So for those of you who are familiar with the politics of Singapore, this should start to raise some questions. Singapore is not a democratic state, uh, and it does not have the same sort of political uh, mechanisms of citizen feedback and citizen opposition that we might see in a place like Finland. So when we, when we see these ideas circulating elsewhere, it should start to raise uh, a number of questions about what happens when a concept like this, which is very much a product of the institutional spaces and research spaces of, an, of uh, liberal democratic institutions and higher education projects, when it travels to less democratic states. Or perhaps we should ask the question, less democratic hands. Right? Because a lot of this uh, thinking about authoritarianism today is pushing beyond the statist uh, frames and the sort of territorial trap, as the political, ge John, uh, political geographer John Agnew speaks about it. 
what do we need to ask ourselves in thinking about uh, how these these ideas and these technologies circulate beyond that uh, and and moving again outside of the realm of a place like Finland to places like Russia uh, Yekaterinburg did not actually get the Expo 2025 that's going to Osaka uh, but nonetheless you see how this this idea is part of that sales pitch for uh, for hosting these big events uh, it's also traveling to Central Asia, a uh, place where I do a lot of my own research in uh, Baku or in Astana, now Nur Sultan, uh, to Kyrgyzstan and even Turkmenistan. We're working for smart cities in Turkmenistan. Uh, for anybody who has been to Turkmenistan, that might seem quite surprising. Um, and, and in fact, I, I think that is a big piece of this conversation that we need to have is, you know, how real are these initiatives? How much of it is just PR? And I'll come back to exactly that question. Uh, but you, you see this idea also circulating to a place like Egypt, which is planning now for a new capital and a place where uh, citizen opposition and surveillance technologies have been increasing in their intensity, but to actually look at the, the advertisements and the justifications for the new capital project, you see that it is being framed as a smart city uh, where all of these sort of technologies of surveillance are built into the very fabric of the city from, from bottom up. Um, the very same story for Saudi Arabia's new um, greenfield project project Neom, which is in the sort of north, uh, the northwest corner of Saudi Arabia, a massive new project, uh, which is again being framed as a smart city, a place where you can build those surveillance technologies just as much as the greening technologies and, and other sort of initiatives that we most commonly associate with smart cities into the fabric of the city. And the other places where I'm working, uh, Qatar and the UAE, this is a very strong presence. Uh, and in fact, just thinking about the case of Abu Dhabi, which you see here in this, this particular advertisement, that Abu Dhabi ranks ahead of Dubai in the smart city technology-based development. That's great. Um, but if you actually stop and ask the questions about how this relates to surveillance, uh, Abu Dhabi now has a massive, massive surveillance system, video surveillance system, called the Falcon Eye. The Falcon Eye initiative uh, was basically developed in cooperation with Israeli security uh, companies, and it was justified initially as part of the Smart City project for Abu Dhabi. Uh, you cannot go anywhere in Abu Dhabi and not feel that there are three or four or five different cameras pointed at you. Uh, this is something that in my, my spring semester in Abu Dhabi, I, I could not escape uh, in any way. But, you know, we can, we can very proudly proclaim that Abu Dhabi is, is ahead of Dubai and their smart city technology. Um, and, and this is a way of, you know, building these technologies uh, and into the popular consciousness, but framing it as somehow less, uh, less pernicious. And this is something, uh, otherwise I won't speak too, too much about this, but uh, that in in the entire region and through these new smart city technologies, you saw the reference in Singapore uh, to having citizens interacting constantly with the government through their smartphones. Uh, this is a model that the Gulf governments are trying to do as well. Um, and you look at these major mobile, t mobile telephone providers in uh, the UAE and Qatar and Saudi Arabia, almost all of them are owned by, uh, by the royal family members or by the governments themselves. So the governments are directly controlling this information and decisions about how this data is being used. So this is a model that is being promoted through these, these smart city technologies and, and projects across the region. But in addition to that, these providers, these companies do Etisalat or do, for example, they're going out and they're acquiring mobile phone enterprises in other countries, in Egypt, for example 
in Lebanon, for example. Uh, so many of these Gulf countries and the Gulf sovereign wealth funds are now controlling those telecom industries in other countries. Um, so we're not just talking about the sort of surveillance technologies as limited within those states, but as that sort of capital enterprise uh, reaches into other, other places, a way of extending and exerting that control through controlling data and access to data elsewhere. So this kind of brings us to this question, you know, of, of is this a slippery slope if we're trying to promote these new technologies and, and initiatives? Uh, is, is this just sort of uh, a techno fetishism that, uh, that is only going to take us down to the bottom of that slippery slope? I think this is a question that some scholars in, in the discipline of geography and elsewhere have considered. Uh, this is just one paper from, uh, from Rob Kitchen who talks about the ethics of smart cities. And he raises a number of these sort of ethical concerns, which I won't go into in detail. Uh, but you can uh, assume what they are for, for yourselves. You've probably engaged in conversations uh, with friends and family about exactly these issues, about anonymity and consent when you are thinking about how your mobile data is being used, or when you find out that Google has, in fact, been tracking your location constantly, uh, and you did not actively give consent for that. So these are questions that have been discussed and are being debated in what we consider liberal democratic contexts. Um, other scholars have also talked about the corporatization of this rhetoric, that smart, seeing smart cities as a, as a form of corporate storytelling, that maybe nothing fundamental is changing, uh, but in this case study at least they're looking at how IBM is using uh, the smart city discourse, basically just to pitch its products and to make it, it look like uh, partnering with them or buying their products is a necessity if you want to get to the next step in the Smart City uh, World Congress Expo uh, event, right, and win that award next year. Uh, so these are critiques that have been made amongst scholars. But between this article and, and the, the one before, uh, both of these of these. Uh, scholars are focusing almost exclusively on Western liberal contexts, and they're not necessarily thinking about this challenge of authoritarianism and what happens when you translate these concepts into authoritarian, uh, into authoritarian states. So this is uh, one thing that I, I have been focusing my work on, and I won't speak much about this, but I do think that this issue of, of authoritarianism and the challenge of, of authoritarianism also links back to this bigger question about cybersecurity issues in the liberal democratic states. Um, and again, another picture from the presentations a couple of days ago here, this focus on open data. And how do we get the city of Helsinki, for example, to bring its data into, um, into the public sphere and get this into the hands of developers? Well, in the same moment that you're promoting open data for the purpose of democracy and transparency, you're also then open opening up that as a potential site of attack. And I think this is where a lot of these barriers uh, to promoting these initiatives uh, come come into question with uh, with the politics of this. So I, again, I, this is more of a footnote. I won't talk too much about that here, but maybe we can have a discussion about it uh, later. But certainly, it is something that a number of cities do have to think about. As um, you know, whether they're authoritarian states or agents of authoritarian states or just evil hackers, who knows, holding cities hostage, um, even with a place that's relatively low tech like Baltimore, this is a serious concern and is something that needs to be considered in, uh, in, in promoting these initiatives wherever they may be. So coming back then to that question that I posed earlier, you know, about how real these projects are. Uh, is this really just corporate storytelling and is this just PR for the regimes who want to promote themselves like in Turkmenistan as developing something modern? Um, I think the real question actually is, is not necessarily whether they produce an actual smart city as if there's some sort of essential, uh, you know, essence to that that we can evaluate, but rather to ask about what sort of work that concept does. Uh, and this, this is the piece that I'm particularly interested in. These, these concepts do real work, and they help sell certain products. They sell, help sell certain ideas, uh, tangible or not. So when we 
actually take a look at how authoritarian regimes themselves are using the smart city discourse, I think that there's two major things that we see them doing. Um, that it is being used in places like Egypt or the UAE or, um, uh, well, frankly, anywhere, Singapore, uh, to increasingly monitor citizens. And this can be domestic populations, but also increasingly monitoring citizens abroad. And that this this uh, is, is an important way of exerting that control of diaspora populations and dissidents abroad. Um, and this discourse is also being used to whitewash uh, the regime image by appearing modern and progressive. Look, we have this, uh, this new environment this new sort of uh, technological advance and we're promoting this and also appearing green and environmentally conscious. For those of you who pay attention to the discourse in Helsinki, uh, you know that a lot of it focuses on being uh, promoting conservation and this is a major element to the smart city discourse and, and something that uh, most of the authoritarian regimes that I'm focusing on are actively trying to do, of trying to promote this image of being green and modern. And so it's a simultaneous sort of whitewash and a greenwashing that happens through these uh, these particular discourses, and it's it's this mix that also leads a lot of people to just push back and say, well, it's not real, right? If it's just greenwash or it's just whitewash, then we don't need to consider it. But in fact, I think that we absolutely do need to consider it, um, precisely for the reasons that many scholars long before me have focused on, um, and uh, that you know, this, this sort of marriage of technological fetishism and uh, the utopianism of technology when it comes together with the sort of discourses of modernity, that there are some extremely pernicious effects that can result from that. Uh, so I won't go into the, the theoretical side of the arguments of Bauman or Buck Morris or, or Foucault here, uh, but you are, are well aware of the difficulties that are presented when we have a sort of utopian push uh, for the future and the, the violences that are then uh, wrought as a result of that. And we don't need to look so far back here or even to the scholarly realm necessarily to, to consider this, right? For anybody who is paying attention to uh, this, this recent development a couple of years ago when uh, this, this robot was unveiled at the Future in Investment Initiative in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, um, that this is kind of eerie in a lot of ways, right? Uh, that there is a, there is a kind of um, uh, danger in these, these uh, technologies being introduced by particular companies, by particular regimes. So it was a Hong Kong-based company that developed this. Um, but you know, this, this is an AI robot that gives its reaction to this, this announcement uh, that it has been granted citizenship, uh, that this, this robot woman is feeling honored by this, but many citizens or many individuals residing in Saudi Arabia have no hope of ever getting citizenship and certainly uh, can't wear themselves uh, go in public without um, without the abaya covering. So this idea of these technologies somehow uh, having this human orientation or perhaps overcoming some of those divides, uh, giving a human face to the technology is quite problematic, uh, but it is also something that has been promoted in the recent um, smart city initiative in Russia here, of this people-centric, people sustainable smart city. Um, and the, the probably too small for people to read there, but the, in the promotion on this website of, of the Smart City Initiative just outside of Moscow. It says that we are creating a new Moscow neighborhood, the perfect place to live, work, and rest. Uh, the neighborhood comprises an urban environment for international professionals and a comfortable living space in the midst of nature. Here again, it's, it's combining the natural and uh, the, the technological to show this as something that is modern, it's forward, it's progressive, it's enticing to those professionals communities and as you can see here on on the map approximately where where they are locating it for anybody who's interested in more the the website for um, for the site is there so this is also a project that has been developed and is actively being worked on uh, by the Zaha Hadid architecture 
company. So Zaha Hadid is a very famous uh, Iraqi-born architect, uh, but she has, uh, well, she's, she's since passed, but she has worked and her firm has worked in a number of different authoritarian countries without any particular qualms about that. Uh, she was responsible for the design of one of the stadiums for the Qatar World Cup. And she was critiqued for this, uh, and she pushed back, and she basically said, "I don't, I don't really care what the what the country does uh, related to the uh, related to the working conditions. I'm going to do this project, and it's not my job to monitor the role of the uh, to to monitor the condition, the working conditions of the of the individuals there in Qatar." So she's come under critique for this, um, but whatever the critiques may be for a project like this, I think the really important piece is to note that she and her company are making money, right? And these initiatives are extremely expensive, uh, and and they do help sell certain products that uh, continue the name of of this famous architecture firm and build up that image of it being uh, a famous sort of uh, company. And this is something that I'm, I, I look at in my recent book on the geopolitics of spectacle, that this is a kind of spectacle, and it is a spectacle that is useful. Yes, it's PR. Yes, it's about public relations, and it's about selling corporate visions. It's about selling products. It's about selling a particular story of a government. Um, but at the same time, spectacle has these real effects, right, about what actually gets built, um, when, where, and who wins and who loses. So there are certain actors, like Zahadid's architecture company and, and the the, the Russian partners here that do benefit, right? That they, they have some um, some stake in the game, and a lot of these companies and other actors that are winning from this discourse are those really elite firms, and they are Western firms. They are staffed in large part by um, by European and Western uh, or American educated. Uh, experts, those that are staffing a place like McKinsey and Company, Honeywell, Arab, EDF in, in France, uh, even Huawei, which is involved in the, the Baku plans for the Smart City Initiative. And many of these companies and individuals are getting these projects and selling these projects through a kind of racialized labor politics here, right? These are the, 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 if you work in a place like the Gulf, or you work in a number of these other places, whiteness is essential to be considered among the experts. And this sort of whiteness and expertise is being sold and marketed exactly by these companies. And if you look at any of the initiatives, uh, or the, the work done by McKinsey, this is, this is core to their vision. But what gets left out in the little side corner, right, here the side note, is, is exactly who these workers are um, that Zaha Hadid and others don't necessarily care about. And the other piece that gets overlooked in, in a number of these discussions about smart cities is exactly who's protesting it. Who, is, who are the faceless masses who are aware that there are problems with this uh, setup in their surveillance states as they are increasing and actively going out there in the, the streets here you know, from, from the, the Hong Kong protests and knowing that they have to cover their face even when it has been outlawed, knowing that this is a, an act that they have to do, that this, these sorts of agencies get rejected. Um, the other sorts of things that get overlooked by, these, by this discourse is the spectacular failures. Um, I, if anybody came in earlier, you saw some of the sort of techno-fetishistic vision of the Khazar Islands outside of Baku uh, that, that were being promoted by Ibrahim Ibrahimov in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, and he had this grand vision, um, and well, this is from a couple of years ago, but a, a, a grand vision that is a massive bust, right? So these sorts of failures are often overlooked as well in these initiatives, that the, the focus of the spectacle is on the positive and on the vision rather than necessarily what the fallout is, what actually happens. 
So just to kind of bring a few final points that I want to make about um, the aura of techno-modernity and some of the challenges of this, uh, that when thinking about spectacle and when writing about spectacle, I, I talk about how it has the power to divert, divert attention. It is diversionary in the sense of it can be fun and exciting, but it's also diversionary in the sense of redirecting your attention, redirecting the gaze. Um, so some of the things that this discourse can do or has been used to do in the places where I'm working is to help deepen and justify the deepening of the reach of these surveillance states, uh, reproducing the interests of these authoritarian leaders and their allies. And their allies might not be in their country. They might be allies uh, in the corporate world. And in fact, uh, the, these uh, smart city discourses also help, uh, can help to reframe public discussions away from publicly or politically sensitive issues like development priorities. Should Saudi Arabia be building this massive greenfield city in the middle of the desert at all? Probably not. Should Egypt be investing in this massive new capital? Probably not. Um, the, the very same questions uh, about you know, development that, that we see all around the world as a justification for these new greenfield projects. Um, other politically sensitive issues about surveillance and corporatism get deflected, but they get built into the system either way. Uh, the fourth element, I would say, is that we see these uh, discourses helping to deepen the ties between liberal and illiberal states via these corporate initiatives. Um, and sometimes we can call this science through these scientific exchanges. Um, and sometimes those scientific exchanges are really big money-making opportunities for our universities, for our research institutions. Uh, and I do think that it is extremely important that we think about um, exactly how this works. And the fifth piece that I would say that, that we see these discourses helping to do is to reproduce this fiction of a world territorially divided between free and unfree places. Uh, so we have, you know, the, the, the quintessential Freedom House map um, that, that there is this, this beautiful green space of the free and that there cannot be any sort of contamination across those territorial borders, right? So this is what I mean by this fiction of, of a world territorially divided as such. When we stop and we think about it, yes, we know that this is a fiction, that there are authoritarian pra practices and all sorts of transgressions across these borders, uh, but this fiction gets reproduced. And the smart city discourse um, is, is being used in many ways to continue to perpetuate this. So coming back then to the challenges of authoritarianism and the questions that are, are raised in Rob Kitchen's article about, about the ethics of smart city discourse, he writes that this argument is not that we need to abandon the creation of these smart cities and these sorts of approaches, but that we need to rethink them and rethink how they, they might have pernicious effects and try to minimize those pernicious effects. I think the question that we all should then be asking ourselves is how? How do we just r try and minimize those effects when we don't necessarily know what happens with a technology? We can't control a technology. That's the point of it. A person can use a computer to do something good or bad. Uh, so how do we go about doing this? He suggests a few things. Um, he says that researchers need to consider ethical implications of their work with respect to all of these other issues that, um, that we know well and to care for for fellow citizens, not to expose them to harm. But he gives this one caveat that it's actually often quite difficult to define what harm is. And to that, I would also add, it is quite difficult to define who is harmed. Because different people benefit from different technologies. Different people will lose from different technologies. So who is defining harm? Who should be at the center of this, of this discussion and these, these questions? For me then, in thinking about the ethics of smart cities and any sort of ethical frames, many people often think that ethics is just, you know, you have a code and you follow that code. Ethics is not that. Ethics is a set of questions. It's a way of posing questions, of considering how we might approach a, a problem. And that this ethics starts with a set of questions, not answers. And to that, again, I would also add, so should democracy. So, thank you. Yeah.